So it's, I understand the question, but it's not the way to think about it. Okay. Because what, what you're talking about is basically like, you know, like the force required, the, end, the work you have to do to bring the walls in to set up this. But that's missing the point about how you define a, an ensemble, an a thermodynamic ensemble. So once I define a thermodynamic ensemble, and of course I can go to any ensemble I want to, um, but once you define that ensemble, then you know what all the variables are and what is the relevant thermodynamic potential, the free energy, that must be minimized in, in equilibrium. So in a fixed box, that work that you're doing is what you get when you transform, say, to a Gibbs potential, to a Gibbs ensemble, where now I, I apply the pressure and let the volume fluctuate. Okay, and then that, that PV term comes back. And by the way, I didn't mention this because it was more of a detail, but you can do these simulations at constant pressure too in the Gibbs ensemble. Let the box fluctuate. And I should have also said, we let the box change shape, do whatever it wants to do, because we don't want to preclude any symmetry. But you can do that. You can fix the pressure um, and, and let the thing change shape. We do that in order to calculate equations of state. And you still get all the same. Crystal structures, which you must, if they're equilibrium, then they must be the same in any thermodynamic ensemble. Okay. So we both had to come all the way from Michigan. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> In the thermodynamic limit is where all thermodynamic ensembles must be equivalent. So, so when the Jim is saying is putting it in the box, that's not in the thermodynamic limit, right? Sure. So with any computer simulation, that is always true. So you always do bigger and bigger boxes and make sure that your results don't depend on the box so size. Like finite size scaling. Yeah. So you can absolutely, <laughs> you always must check for finite size effects. And so I wouldn't have shown you anything that had finite size effects. But you do always check that. So, for example, the systems that, that spontaneously form these enormous um, unit cells, those we had to redo in very big systems. So you had, you know, 100 unit cells across the box, say. Eh? So you're sure that you don't, that you don't have any finite size effects. Uh, Sorry, I just had a remark. The hematism, the parallel phenomenon, uh, was probably discovered by Jacques Vélin in the mm -hmm. world of disorder. It's, it's closely related. Yes. And it's active in the uh, in iron based superconductors. Curiously enough, in the magnetism. And that's an ent ent entropically Probably driven. In the, 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 the partially, the pneumatic state that forms the oligomagnetic is driven by order disorder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, so this is fantastic. You've done thousands of, of monomer lattices. Have you started looking at binary systems? Yep, yep. Binaries, ternaries, um, I mean, there's a lot yeah. that you could do. Yeah. And so, in fact, so I should, I could show, so all of these people, for example, are doing, everyone has a different system. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding, I'm totally kidding. There's only 35 of them in the group right now, but each one has like different systems, okay? So the idea is, so, so first of all, with a binary mixture, they can, uh, having nothing to do with shape, we know that binary mixtures, so if you have two different size spheres, for example, they can demix to maximize entropy or they can mix to maximize. Oh my god, this thing. That Where's so that room? Um, they can mix to, to maximize entropy. So we're just writing up a paper now where we studied a mixture of tetrahedra and octahedra. And that was done by Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so you mix octahedra tetrahedra. We know the pure octahedra give BCC, really like a shared BCC. And we know that uh, tetrahedra give the quasi-crystal. So if you mix them together, it turns out that you, they will tile space if you pack them perfectly together in the right stoichiometry. So if you mix them together with, with size ratios 1 to 9, stoichiometry is 1 to 9, you know, and so we get those phases, and we get these interesting coexisting phases. So like you can get a coexisting ordered binary phase coexisting with the quasi-crystal, or coexisting with BCC. So all of the things that we would expect to be able to see when we have interactions, when you have like an AB mixture, um, and you have interactions, we see the same sorts of things here. Yeah. Okay. 
and you have a very large group, I mean, you could put them in a box. <laughs> Just a question. And they're definitely under constant pressure. <laughs> speak up, speak up. Turn off the mic. Uh, yes. With all oh my God, I have to walk Turn off the mic. This is fun. This is Just crazy. speak up. Without reference to any atomic orbitals or something, how could you get this uh, diamond structure out of carbon and something? Because I couldn't hear the end. Without reference to? Any atomic structure, atomic orbits, how would you get diamond structure out of carbon and out of carbon atoms. Carbon atoms. Basically, can you explain? Can you explain real diamond? I think is the question. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. So <laughs> no. I mean, so carbon. I mean, you have to. I mean, there needs to be something that's breaking the symmetry to give you this staggered ethane configuration. And for carbon, I don't know how to get that without thinking in terms of orbitals, right? Here we have these these shapes that are. Um, that are sort of symmetric and identical. Well, they have certain symmetries. But the point is that they have these four sides, basically. So they're promoting this, uh, of, you know, four particles in the, na in the nearest neighbor shell. And in fact, OK, let me just go back and just show you really quick. Then someone is going to buy me a martini for sure. <laughs> uh, Diamond. So this is the thing that makes diamond. And in fact, the born cell of diamond is an augmented truncated tetrahedron. Take a tetrahedron, snip the edges, and then put little caps on them. And um, and so if you see this, this okay, I lost my thing. But anyway, this this right here. So what's happening is the yellow one on the inside is flipped over. So like when we have the perfect tetrahedron, thank you. Is this a? Uh, the, the lower button. Uh, lower button. Oh my God. Okay, I got it. I got it. So in here, um, th when the particles are perfect tetrahedra, they all kind of align in the same way. But then when you snip them enough, they it turns out that the entropy in the box is maximized if they flip over every other one. And by flip flipping over. If, you're fl if they flip over every other one, and then over on this face, and on this face, and on this face, they flip every other one, that's basically like the staggered ethane configuration. I don't know that this helps you understand carbon, like diamond from carbon, real diamond. Uh, I think we kind of, uh, maybe we'll finish with two more questions. There's a question here and then a question from Karen. Yeah, go ahead. Just uh, speak up because uh, okay. of the feedback. Yeah. So uh, you showed how uh, uh, from a token, uh, Mechanisms you get an effective force, uh, <coughs> and uh, and you also showed how you, uh, how you can tune up alchemical potential to change shapes. So uh, I would think that what, if you change shapes, would you be able to change uh, uh, tune this effective force? Uh, for example, in mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are questions in uh, the interplay between kinetic and uh, interaction effects, with, like Wigner crystallization, mm -hmm. and can you? Can you study these uh, exotic uh, ordering effects by tuning the paradigm potential to give you different forces? That's a cool idea. I haven't thought about using it in that way. But certainly when we change the shape, we are changing the strength and directionality of these emergent entropic forces. And so there's a lot more a lot more to play with than in yeah. the next matter we, we just tune interaction versus kinetic energy and we get weakness and crystallization and all of these. And with your parametric potential, you can tune your directionality as well as... Yeah, we can definitely tune the directionality. And, but of course, these are state functions, right? These potential mean force and torque at that density or at that pressure. That's what the emergent force is. If I change the pressure, then I change the emergent force. So you, if you change both... So you, so you can either use traditional thermodynamic parameters or the shape and change that force around. Great. Right. Keeping everything else constant. Yeah. Keeping potential by going yes. from one, one shape to another yeah. shape. Yeah. That would be an interesting transition point. Yeah. And I should say, by the way, just quickly, that the alchemical potential framework that I showed here is not just for shape, it's for anything. 
So you can use it for, for a pair potential. So you have point particles and molecular dynamics simulation, and you want to find a pair potential that will give you class rate 2 structure or an icosahedral quasi-crystal structure or any structure you want. You can use this to tell you what pair potential to use. You have to put constraints so that it doesn't give you a pair potential that looks like that. Right, so you can say, well, I only want two wells, and the distance between the wells can't be more than something, and the relative height between the wells can't be more than something, and then you can parameterize it and then move the parameters around. And in one simulation, it'll pop out the right pair potential for you. So, that, yeah. Oh, that's right. So we'll just take two more questions. Sorry, I lied slightly. We'll take two more questions, Karen and then Peter, and we'll, we'll finish and get cocktails then. Karen. Uh, I tried to shout. Evidently, this is, uh, this is a good simulation for for molecular crystals, uh, of course, and you also mentioned this, the interactions are very important and, and those have to be taken into account for carbon and other materials. But I, I would suppose it's to work well for certain molecular materials uh, at low temperature. Uh, but my question is, for, for, uh, what would happen if you added, apart from rotation and translational uh, degrees of freedom, which you probably are taking into account, if you take into account breathing modes, to be able to apply better to those things. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And <laughs> so that's Rosie's thesis project right here. So we're letting the these things breathe because Ultimately, you can apply this say to protein crystallization, right? So that's a big topic. Proteins, you know, do this. What is the contribution to the stabilization of a protein crystal that's coming just from entropy? We know that, of course, there's charges, there's all kinds of interactions. But if we want to know what's the role of entropy, then you might want these things to be able to, to breathe. So she's written some algorithms that allow us to let these things breathe in, di in different ways or reconfigure different ways and tease that entropy out of the of the other energy. Yeah, thanks for the question. And the last question from uh, Peter Little. Peter. Sorry, thank you. But I, I shouldn't I don't deserve the last word. It's true. Uh, okay, well let's go to the If you start tethering structures or making them sticky, uh, presumably you can make things with large holes in it. Yes. And it would be nice to have a way of of making structures that really do have big holes or you can control the size yep. of do you have so a method? <laughs> <laughs> you know what each of these students is actually doing? I do. No, okay, first of all, first of all only, the, only the, these three rows are in the group. No, these two rows, and two and a half rows are in the group right now. I'm sorry. This is just, it's not all of them. I didn't want to give the wrong impression. Anywho, yes, of course. So we, we work a lot with experimental groups like Chad Brunken and Chris Murray and Nikotov and others where they have sticky interactions between their particles, it could be DNA, it could be organic ligands, whatever, um, and we, all of that we can build into our, into our codes, and some of them can be, can be made to form these big open structures. So do you think you could turn that into a strategy for making big open structures? Yes, absolutely. If I say I want something with yes. five nanometer pores, made out of silicon. Yes. So, with this alchemy, with this new alchemical approach, we have nothing to do with studying entropy and merger, just the alchemical approach. If you tell me what structure you want and what kinds of building blocks you might want, then I can tell you how, what building blocks they should be, like what shape they should be, how strong the interaction should be, how long range the interaction should be. Yes, we should be able to do that. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, let's thank Sharon for an incredible talk.